Okay. We read in the uh, portion of Chukas about the Poraduma, the red heifer. The Torah refers to this law of the Poraduma, the red heifer, as the most difficult statute which one can't even approach to comprehend its value or its rationale. Shlomo Melech, King Solomon, who was the wisest man who ever lived, is referred to as the Chochem Yikol Adam, where the Midrash tells us that his wisdom was kechol hayom. His wisdom was like the sand on the beaches, on the ocean, that if you take all the wise men, all the sages of Klal Yisrael, and all Klal Yisrael, put them on one side of the scale, and you encapsulate all their wisdom, and you put Shlomo Melech on the other side of the scale, Shlomo's wisdom was greater than all, all of theirs combined. That was the wisdom and the Chochmah of Shlomo Melech. It was greater. And Shlomo Melech says, all statutes he was able to fathom and understand their reason, their rationale, but the Chok, the statute of Paraduma, he wasn't able even to approach. Rechokim mimenu, mimeni. It's distant from me. These are the words of Shlomo Melch. Now, what was so difficult about the Paraduma? The Paraduma is something very interesting that there's no level of contamination that if you become contaminated, you can't relieve yourself of that spiritual contamination. You come in contact with a rodent, with the carcass of an animal, person has a certain type of emission which creates a level of contamination. One follows this procedure. You go to a mikvah, you immerse yourself, you have to wait a certain period of time, you achieve a level of spiritual purity. You come in contact with the dead, the only way you could be relieved of that impurity, you have to undergo the ritual of the red heifer, which is discussed in this week's parsha, this week's portion, where it's an animal, it's a heifer which is totally red. If it even has two black hairs, it doesn't qualify. Meeting many criteria, it's burnt, and you take some of its ash, put it into water, whatever, and it's sprinkled by the coin on the person who's contaminated on the third and seventh day. Then he goes to the mikvah, and then he's spiritually pure. That's the only way he can be relieved of this incontractable type of contamination. Now the question is, why, why this contamination is so severe and serious that any other means of normally of relieving impurity has no application here. You need specifically the process of the red heifer in addition to the mikvah, which is full immersion into a body of water which meets many criteria to, to bring about spiritual purity. The question is why, what is this? There's something else which is very unique and not understandable. It's contradictory. The most severe level of contamination can only be relieved by the paradoma, by the red heifer, the ritual red heifer. Yet, it's metairis atmeim. It purifies those who are contaminated. But the one who's involved in the process, he becomes contaminated. Something which is an enigma. I mean, Seemingly, it's totally logical. It's contradictory in itself. Here it has the ability to relieve the most extreme level of contamination, and yet the one who's involved in the process, he becomes contaminated. So why? And the Torah says, Zos chukas Torah. This is the, sta the statute of the Torah, the ultimate statute. So Rashi cites the Midrash, that Midrash says that Soton and Umus Ola Monis Yisrael Satan and the nation of the world, they come and they aggrieve the Jewish people and they say to us, Ma mitzazos, what is this mitzvah all about? Two things they say. What is this mitzvah all about? Uma tam yeshpa. And what's its rationale? Two things. What is it all about? And ma tam yeshpa. Now, the law is if you consecrate an animal as a sacrifice and you slaughtered outside the Mishkan or the Beis Amigdosh, it carries the liability of spiritual excision. That's how severe it is. If you sacrifice it outside the Beis Amigdosh, outside of the Mishkan or the temple, it carries the liability of spiritual excision. 
anything of, of consecrated nature, which has relevance to atonement, has to be done inside the confines of the Beis Hamikdash or the Mishkan. But yet we find on Yom Kippur, which is the ultimate day of atonement, there was a, a korban. It was a consecrated animal, and it was a goat. It was called Sol Azozel. It was taken into the desert, thrown down a jagged mountain by a designated person, and it brought about the atonement for every conceivable sin. And because it carried such a level of impurity, the person who transported it, he became contaminated from it. So it's called Sar Meshtaleach, the goat that's sent off. So the Ramban over there goes to explain if it's a korban, it seems to be, God forbid, I and mean, what we say that the nether forces or the location of Satan is in the desert. So what? If a Jew brings a sacrifice to any angel, the whole concept of deity, these are angels, these are powers. You sacrifice to an angel, that's idolatry. That's idolatry. So are we bringing a korban, chas v'sholem, to Satan? We want to somehow bring, serve him. The Jew only serves God. Satan is only an agent of God. That's all he is, to do what he does. The angel of death is an agent of God. That's the angel of death. Any maloch is God's agent. Maloch means the angel, the agent of God, spiritual agent. So what are we sending this off into the desert? So Rabban goes to explain that what is it analogous to? It's analogous to a king who has a banquet and he has certain servants. And he says, take some of the leftovers and feed my servants, my slaves, because I don't want them to interfere with the banquet, because they could somehow interfere, create a certain degree of interference. Satan is the ultimate prosecutor of the Jewish people. And he was created to prosecute. And unfortunately, there's what to prosecute. There's a record that, that, that could be prosecuted. Yom Kippur is the ultimate day of atonement. This is the open day of Rachmim, where Hashem says, Satan cannot prosecute. I will not allow him to prosecute. That's how great, because we say Hasoton, the numerical value of Hasoton, the Satan, is 364, not 365. To indicate there's one day a year which Satan is not permitted to prosecute. Despite the fact the record is not a perfect record. If the record is not prosecuted, is not audited, it doesn't mean anything. And therefore, God forgives us. So we want to keep him satisfied. So we're not serving him. It's not a sacrifice to him. What proof of the pudding is, how does the Sor Lazos, how is it designated to be the goat that's sent off? It's by a lot. Hashem is the, is the designator. We don't consecrate it as that. We're not the designators of that. To indicate that this is not a sacrifice that's been brought to some deity, to some angel, to some power. So he says, the paraduma, it atones for what? For the impurity of coming in contact with the dead. What is death? Death itself, the contamination of death, has to do with impure, it's an impure force. The most extreme impure force. That's what it is. That has to do with the nether forces. So where do we bring that animal? Where is it burnt? Where is it stored, it's ash? Where is the whole ritual done? outside it borders on the desert that's where it's done again because it's to deal with this issue it's not a korban for that reason so that's the what is the nature of this mitzvah that's firstly that's my, if this is a korban it's a sacrifice what do you, it should be in the in the in the base of migdor should be in the temple it should be in the mishkan why is it out there that's one of the questions satan and the nations of the world there secondly what's its rationale it's contradictory here it relieves the most extreme level of impurity and simultaneously the one who engages with it he becomes contaminated it seems to be totally illogical contradictory what is the rationale okay that's how we're explaining the midrash but it's interesting why this impurity cannot be relieved unless you undergo this ritual with the part of the world. let's understand what is the source of this impurity death now, before Adam ate of the tree of knowledge, he was meant to live eternally. 
God says, the day you will eat of the tree of knowledge, the fruit of good and evil, you will be subject to death. When you ingest that evil, you'll be subject to death. Now, why will you be subject to death? So the Ramchal explains, Moshe Chaim Lutzatu explains, that man is meant to live eternally. That was the original program. He was meant to live eternally. Although man was not created perfect, but nearly perfect, but whatever his, he was, he was pure. He had to advance himself to a level of perfection. What would have been his achievement if he would have? He would have reached a level of perfection. But what, what was the challenge? Not to eat of the tree of knowledge. If he would have not eaten of the tree of knowledge, he would have met that challenge to achieve perfection. Not only did he not meet the challenge, he ingested the fruit, which is, contains within it the most potent force of, of evil. This became intermingled in his being. So now, could this human being be eternal now? Can't be eternal any longer. Because evil cannot live on, cannot be eternal. That's why man has to die. When he dies, he decomposes. When he decomposes, and ultimately he will be resurrected, he'll be resurrected with the matter, with the pure matter, but the evil remains in the ground. This is the concept of resurrection. Death and being resurrected. He cannot live in the state of being that he is. We all descend from Adam. We all have this potent evil force within us. It cannot be extracted, and therefore man has to die, ultimately be resurrected if he merits resurrection. Not everybody merits resurrection, okay? Now, so what is death a derivative of? Death is a direct outgrowth growth of that evil. That evil cannot be extracted. Cannot be extracted. Every other contamination of the dead, an animal, a rodent, that is unrelated to evil. That's unrelated. That's not man's dying. It says, Ein misa blochet. You only die because there's that original sin. An animal doesn't die because of original sin. Animal dies or rodent dies. They're not meant to be eternal. A human being is meant to be eternal. So what is the source and the basis for death? That evil that originally was ingested. That evil is so incontractable, so enmeshed in our being, going to a mikvah, immersing yourself, is, cannot relieve it. It's only the process of the paraduma, which we'll discuss in the moment. Only that process, following the exact prescription of the, only that can relieve you of that impurity, because that's impurity of the death of the dead, which is directly a result, an outgrowth of that evil. That's why it can only be relieved only through the paraduma. Now, Rashi cites Ramosha Darshan later that he explains all the various aspects of the paraduma. The Torah tells us, V'yikwe lecho. Now, the proceeds which it's purchased with, whose money is it purchased with? It's the money of the Klaus of the Jewish people. Why? Because when originally the suggestion of the golden calf came about, it was made of gold, they were able to gather the gold almost instantaneously. Where did it come from? All the Jews gave of their gold. They removed their jewelry, and that was the gold which comprised the golden calf. So just as you gave the gold for the golden calf, the atonement to relieve that, the consequence of that sin, which is death, you must pay with it with, from your own proceeds. That's a correction of the original. Poraduma, the red heifer now. The golden calf, the calf is the child, is the offspring of the cow. So Ramosha Darshan says, what is it analogous to? You have a maidservant in the palace of the king. The child goes and soils the palace. So what, what do they say to the mother of that mm -hmm. child? Clean up after your kid. Clean up after your child. You soil the palace, clean up. The pura, the cow, the red heifer, this ritual, that's the mother of the calf. 
by burning it, its ritual, that will correct and remove the impurity of spiritual contamination of the dead, which we'll discuss in a moment. It's aduma, it's red. What does red represent? White is always purity. Red represents sin. Tamima, it must be unblemished. Why must it be unblemished? So he explains, before we sinned with the golden calf, we were unblemished. We were spiritually sound, perfect. When we sinned with the golden calf, we became blemished. We became tarnished. We became damaged spiritually. Lo ole ol, it has to be an animal which no burden, no yoke or any burden was put onto it. Why? Because when we worshipped the golden calf, at, time, at Sinai, we cast off the yoke of heaven. So therefore, the animal that's going to make the correction, it can nothing could have come upon it. Which means it represents what they, just as you were, were a people who had no sense of responsibility to your master, the animal has nothing, no old, has no yoke. Now, this is, this is the most important thing, Limishmeris. After you burn it, the ash has to be kept for safekeeping. Why? Just as the sin of the golden calf is kept in a location for tragedy throughout history, which means, whenever the is punished throughout the ages, whether it was the Crusades, the destruction of the Beis Hamikdash, first temple was destroyed because we violated the what three cardinal sins. The second temple was destroyed, Beis Hamikdash, because we abandoned the Torah, and there was unwarranted. Hate. First was banned Torah and three cardinal sins. Second was sin aschinam, unwarranted, unbased, baseless hate. That's what it was. We had the Crusades. We had all kinds of displacements, upheavals. Holocaust, whatever it was, this is all punishment. So it says, when Hashem punishes us in every one of these situations, part of the punishment goes back to the golden calf. And it's based on, of course it says, Hashem said to Moshe, the day that I will focus on you, I will remember that sin. Okay? What, firstly, why? Why every punishment that we receive, you speak Lashon Hara, you speak damaging speech which has no constructive value, which is a Torah violation, about your fellow. It's a negative, it be multiple negative and positive commandments. Now, why did you speak that? When you're punished for that, you're going to be punished also for the Chet Egel. Every sin, Chet Egel, is associated with that. Why? Now, the Gemara says, the Talmud says, that if we wouldn't have sinned at Sinai, we said, Nasev and Nishma, we accepted her unequivocally, we reached a level of spiritual com completion, perfection, we reverted back to before the sin of Adam. We were exposed to an intensity of God's presence, what we call Shechina, divine presence, that all the impurity in us was vaporized, and we reverted back to pre-sin of Adam. At that point, we would have lived eternally. Like Adam would have lived eternally if he wouldn't have eaten of the tree of knowledge, we would have lived eternally. When we sinned with the golden calf, we reverted back to post-sin. We became subject to death, and once we were subject to death, we were subject to the evil inclination. So now, why is there an evil inclination? Because we sinned with the golden calf. So therefore, every sin, every transgression, every desecration of God's name, from that point going forward till the end of time, till coming Mashiach, why does it happen? Because we sinned with golden calf. So everything is attributed to that golden calf issue. I'll give you an example. A person breaks his arm very seriously, and they're able to, to reattach the arm, microsurgery, neurosurgery, and the hand functions. But the weight that the hand normally and the agility the hand originally had, it's not back. And now the person goes, 
and he tries to lift something very heavy, and he, and he can't, and he attempts, and he becomes more seriously injured. Why do I attribute the injury? Just because the, the item was too heavy or because he originally had the original injury? Because he originally had that original weakness, therefore the second encounter hurt him even to a greater degree. So one is linked to the other. Why do we cross that line? Why are we tempted? Why are we drawn in? Why do we lust? Only because of the golden calf. So therefore every encounter of failure is attributed to the golden calf. So therefore, there's a double liability here. Firstly, you're punished for doing the wrong thing. Secondly, it all goes back to the original failing of the golden calf. So whenever God punishes us, for whatever the punishment may be for that transgression, included within that is the golden calf. That's what it is. So therefore, it's the mishmeris. Just the, the ash which is kept has been kept there eternally because that represents that Impurity, which has to be addressed, is something forever. There's no such thing as ever being relieved from that. Until you die, until the end of time, man will be burdened with this evil, which is part and parcel of the human being. And that's the basis for sin. Once it said, we find that Shavuos, the day of the giving of the Torah, our nationhood, was, in the 50, was 50 days after we left Sinai, after we left Egypt. Egypt, Sinai was 50 days later. We reached the pinnacle of our spirituality. Now, the communal offering, carbon that's brought on Shavuos, is, besides the animal, a two loaves made of wheat flour, which are chametz, which are leavened. All male offerings are not leavened. If it's leavened, it's not valid. The meal offering, which is brought on Shavuos, which is wheat, is leavened. Now the question is, why is it leavened? We know that chometz always represents, desire represents the evil inclination. You'd say when you reach your level of the pinnacle of spirituality, that's when it should be leavened. That's when it should be matzah, it should be unleavened. But there says, no, it must be. If it's not leavened, it's not valid. The question is why? The answer is very simple. As a human being, as perfect as you may be, but factually, there's always that element, that trace of evil within every one of us. There's a residue of the tree of knowledge. Therefore, don't ever forget that there's an Achilles heel, that the moment you touch there, it's a slippery slope. Regardless at what level you are, you could, fall, you could revert back to the, to the lowest level. And that's what happened at Sinai. We were at the ultimate level. What happened 40 days later? We are involved with a golden calf. It's unheard of. How is it possible? After you're at that such a perfect level, God speaks to you. You hit the Ten Commands, the Aceros and Debros. You prophesy face to face with God. How is it possible? The answer is because as a human being, you have that trace of evil within you. And you never know when that will rear its head and therefore that could take the person down. And therefore it says in Pirkeovos, Altamin bi atzma ad yom moscha. Don't believe in yourself till the day you die. The moment you die, then you're not subject to temptation any longer. As long as you're alive, till the last moment of your existence, we're all subject to challenge, to temptation. That's a reality. Now, So far, from the beginning of the first Paradum red heifer, until a certain point in history, there were seven red heifers. Every red heifer has to have, Mo, Moshe Rabbeinu was the one who was involved in the first red heifer. The ash of his red heifer has to be intermingled in every red heifer until the end of time, including the red heifer that's gonna be made by the Mashiach. The red heifer always identifies with Moshe Rabbeinu. Referring to the poro, the red heifer that Moshe had made in the desert. So over here, so the Sif Sicham, which the commentator Rashi says, 
Lahar HaMishcho, L'Kanim Gedolim, L'Poros Acheros. The ash of the red heifer, which Moshe had made in the desert, was put ultimately on Har HaMishcho, that's Har HaZesim, Mount of Olives. For other high priests, when they make the future red heifers, that his ash should be intermingled in their ash. Rotsaloma Koporos HaYitzrichem Ariv B'Poros Shel Moshe. And only then does, is it effective. The lav hochi psulim But if it's not intermingled, it's possible. It's not valid. Now the question is, why? Why does the red heifer identify with Moshe Rabbeinu? That's the question. Now, very interesting. Let's go back to, to the story of the eagle, the golden calf. Moshe is in heaven, the 40th day. He's about to come down with the first luchos, first set of tablets. Moshe Rabbein, Hashem says to Moshe, Moshe, leich raid. You must descend immediately. Ki amcho, your people have become corrupted. This is what Hashem says to Moshe. Moshe says to Hashem, says to God, Ami v'loamech, why are they my people, why aren't they your people? They're the Jewish people. He says, when the rabble left Egypt, did you consult with me? You didn't consult with me. The rabble are the ones who actually instigated the gold calf, golden calf. And through their influence, that's where the Jewish people worshiped the golden calf. It was your decision to allow them to come out. Since so it's Amchov Ami. They're your people, they're not my people. Now, it's very interesting now. So what do we attribute the setback of the Jewish people forever till the end of time? Moshe allowing the rabble to come out without consulting with Hashem. Because if they wouldn't have come, there wouldn't have been a golden calf. There wouldn't have been a golden calf, we would have been eternal from that time going forward. All evil would have come to an end and the world would, would have been eternal. Because Moshe allowed the rabble to leave with us, they were the fifth column, they influenced us, we did the golden calf. We reverted back to post-sin. That means every sin till the end of time is attributed to that mistake. Okay? What is the basis for the impurity of death? Chet Egel. So what is, what is Moshe's tikkun, his correction? So impurity of death is attributed to who? If you trace it to the source, to Moshe Rabbeinu. Because Moshe Rabbeinu wouldn't have allowed them out. We would have never failed with the golden calf. Death only exists because there was a golden calf because we reverted to both post-sin. So therefore, every paraduma identifies with Moshe. Because what is the basis for this incontractable impurity which only can be relieved through the paraduma? It's death. Why is there death? Because we did the eagle. Why did we do the eagle? Because Moshe made a decision to let the rabble out to leave with us. Therefore, every paraduma has to be intermingled with the ash of Moshe's paraduma. Because Moshe is, has to be associated with all of it. Now it's very interesting. We find the Mishkan, after the sin of the golden calf, Moshe supplicates Hashem, Hashem forgives us. V'solachti, I forgive you. But now, vosli migdash v'shechanti b'socham. Make for me a sanctuary so I should dwell in your midst. So what's the medium through which Hashem dwells in the midst? That's the Mishkan. Now, what's the Mishkan called? Mishkan Ho'edus. It's called the Mishkan of Testament. Why it's called Mishkan of Testament? So the Medjish says, Rashi cites the Medjish, Edus Olam. It's a testament to the nations of the world that God forgave us for the sin of the golden calf. So the Mishkan itself, initially God dwelt in our midst, directly in our midst. Now, because of the sin of the golden calf, we need a medium, through that medium he dwells in our midst. What is the medium? Mishkan. So now that he dwells, dwells in the midst through that medium is a confirmation that God forgave us for the sin of the golden calf. Okay, that is the Mishkan. That's very interesting. Before the Chet, before the sin of the golden calf, God could dwell directly in our midst. Why? Because the evil was expunged from us because that was pre-sin of, of the golden calf. So therefore it was the quill of the resurrection. Post-sin, we have the evil within us because we reverted back to post-sin. God can't dwell in our midst because he doesn't want to be associated with that level of evil. 
So therefore, we need the medium of the Mishkan from to dwell in our midst, but it's not directly in our midst. It has to come through the medium of the Mishkan. But the Mishkan itself is what? Is a testament. Okay, now let's talk. The mitzvah to build the Mishkan. Who was the mitzvah incumbent upon? It was incumbent upon only Moshe Rabbeinu. The Rechaim points out, if you take a look at the text regarding the building of the Mishkan, every aspect of the Mishkan, the commandment was given directly to Moshe, and he delegated to the Jews to build it on his behalf. So therefore, when every Jew participated in building the Mishkan, or giving the material to the Mishkan, they were all agents of Moshe. We have a principle of agency that the action of the agent is attributed to the one who commissions the agent. So there's the obvious question. Or Chaim Akash doesn't explain it. So he says, why did Hashem want it to be done that way? Because he wanted that all the credit should accrue to Moshe. Now the question is why? He doesn't explain that. The, the way we're explaining it, this is exactly why. Because what's the reason, why did God depart from the Jewish people? Initially he dwelt in our midst. Because we reverted to post-sin. Why do we revert to post-sin? Because of the rabble, which was Moshe's decision. So God left our midst because of Moshe. So how is God re-entering into our midst? Through the medium of the Mishkan. So the Mishkan, if it's attributed and it all accrues to Moshe, what does that mean? Moshe corrected the mistake he had made. Because the ultimate objective is God should dwell in our midst on the terrestrial level. But he can't because we're impure. We, we possess that evil of the, of the Eitz Adas, of the tree of knowledge. So who now creates this edifice, which is the medium from the dwell in our midst? Moshe, you're the one. So now you fully are reinstated with me because you corrected the wrong that originally you brought about through the decision to allow the rabble to come out with us. That's why it was given to Moshe. Now, the Torah writes regarding the laws of contamination of the dead that not only are you contaminated if you come in direct contact with the dead, if you're under the same roof with the remains of a human being, especially a Jew, you're contaminated. How does the Torah express itself? Zos Torah. This is the Torah. Odom ki yomos ba'oel. A man, Odom who dies in a tent, all that's in the tent becomes contaminated. So seemingly, if you read it very simple, what does that mean? Anything in the tent becomes contaminated. But the Gemara says, there's something else we draw from that, that, those words. Zos Torah, Odom ki yomos ba'oel. What is Torah? How does one acquire Torah? Eino Torah niknes el misha memes the only way a person is able to acquire Torah, you have to forego all the physical amenities of life. Ain't a Torah nikness. You can only acquire Torah only if you're willing to die for Torah, to sacrifice, to deprive yourself, to give up all the physical pleasures of life. Only then do you have relevance to acquiring Torah. So the question is why? Why can't I have the best of both worlds? The spiritual world, the physical world. But it seems to me you have to be in a state of deprivation to be able to acquire a Torah and process it properly. Now the question is why. So the way I always understood it was very simple. There's a mitzvah, positive commandment Torah, kadoshim to you. A Jew has to be holy. You have to say, how do you sanctify yourself? Kadosh yisatzman mutaloch. You should sanctify, win yourself from the material, even what's permitted, only partake of the material at the most minimal level. More than the minimal is considered excess. Why? But if it's kosher, it's permitted, why? Because God says, of course, I am holy. God has no relevance to material. Now, what is the basis for every relationship? Compatibility. You have to be compatible. What is the basis for compatibility? Commonality. So the more common there is between two parties, the greater is the degree of compatibility. So if God himself has no relevance to material, so the Jew who weans himself from the material and he only partakes of the, the material to the degree that's necessary, but beyond that he doesn't, so what is he doing? He's assuming the profile of God which he has no relevance to material. We want to establish that commonality so the compatibility should be in, to its fullest. 
That's the idea. Now, what is Torah? Torah is God's wisdom. There's nothing more holy than Torah itself. The world only is in existence, so Torah should be studied. Torah is the energy of eternity. The Chofetz Chaim explains that a human being has to be nourished. We have to have so many calories, so many nutrients. What about a person who's fully nourished one day and doesn't eat for a week? The person has to be continuously replenished that nourishment and the carbohydrates for him to, to function as a human being. So what happens when the person, he passes from this world? That means the infusion of energy and sp- during this lifetime has to last eternity. So what is contained within Torah? What's contained within the, doing a mitzvah? It's an sp- energy, a nourishment, which infuses the soul with an ability to exist eternity, eternally. That's why Sechar Bayel Maleko. There's no such thing as reward in this world. Because what's contained within the mitzvah, it's something which is unfathomable. It's something which has an infinite characteristic. That's, that's the idea. This is, this is the concept. How do you acquire that spiritual essence, which is the ultimate, which is God's wisdom, if you're a physical being? It's not the right platform for processing the ultimate in spirituality. So what do you have to do? You have to assume a profile and a posture of spirituality to be that processing center. Because the greater you have relevance to God, the greater relevance you have to His wisdom. But if you're a physical being, and the more you gravitate, gravitate towards hedonism, you have no relevance. You're, you're, you're an intellectual animal. You're not living as that spiritual being who happens to be within a human body. Therefore, Zosa Torah Odm Kiyamas Ba'oel. This is the Torah of man who dies in a tent. The only way you could acquire Torah is only through denying yourself, depriving yourself of the material and only partake to the degree that you have to partake in the material. To create that commonality for the compatibility, therefore, you are the perfect setting for the Torah itself. Shlomo Melch says in Mishle in Proverbs, Tzadik ochel lesovet nafsho. A tzadik only eats enough to save his soul. Does not eat more than that. Because the tzadik, he understands what's the objective of life. Only to perfect your spiritual. I'll give you an example. A person who's in finance could appreciate this. A person's closing the biggest deal of his life. Multi-billion dollar deal. He hasn't been home for three days. He basically hasn't eaten. He hasn't showered, hasn't had a change of clothing. His wife calls him. You have to come home, you have to eat, you have to take a break, you have to snap. He says to his wife, you don't realize, this is, the li- this is the time of, this is the deal of my life. I can't, for a moment, be busy with anything but this, because nothing has any degree of value versus this. But what are you eating? Bathing, showering, cha- it's all meaningless. Because he recognizes the value of that moment, everything else is meaningless. The tzaddik who understands the infinite value of serving God, and he has 70 years or more to bring about that objective and that accomplishment, he has no time to waste. I have to eat because if I don't eat, I can't go further. But to what degree do I eat? Do I eat for the sake of eating or only to save my soul to be able to address my objective? There's a famous marshal uh, allegory from the Chavetz Chaim. You know, in the, mid- in the medieval times, they had, you know, the fairs, the Basel Fair in Europe. So people would travel from all over Europe to purchase whatever their, their wares were, whether it's textile, glass, diamonds, what, whatever it was. And because people came from every country, Russia, Eastern Europe, Western Europe, wherever they came from, so there would be restaurants set up with all the cuisines. So the Hungarian, go to the Hungarian cuisine, and the Russian, that, the Polish, the Pol- everybody had their place to go, and they would do business simultaneously. So the Jew meets his fellow at, at the fair. There's 
two weeks left to the fair, and it was known that if you purchased well during the fair, you were able to succeed throughout the year. If not, there's no way to, to be in business because he had to buy right to, 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 to pro make profit. He meets his friend two weeks before the fair's over, and he says to him, uh, by the way, how, how did you do? He says, how do you? He says, my w purchases were phenomenal. This year's gonna be a phenomenal year in terms of my profit margin. I bought so cheap, I'll be able to sell. He says, how did you do? He says, how did I do? I'm still visiting the restaurants. I'm vis I haven't tasted all the cuisines. He says, are you out of your mind? You have two weeks left to the fair and you're still busy with the restaurants. You didn't come here to eat, eat the food in the restaurants. You came to purchase your wares to be able to live through the year and succeed. So the Chavetz Chaim writes, person's here for 70 years. What's he busy with? Tasting the cuisines, buying the fabric, wearing the wardrobe and everything else. But that's not what you're here for. You're here to achieve, to take it back with you, the profits. That's what you're here for. Same thing, same idea. So therefore, the person whose objective is what it's supposed to be, he has relevance to God. He could process that information. The person's off track. He has his head in the bucket, in the feed bag. God says, well, well I'm wasting my time with you. You have no relevance to my wisdom. That's the way I always understood it. Therefore, in a Torah, Nik the Sel Misha Memes But the way we're explaining it this way, I mentioned the name of the Vilna Gon that we have four exiles. We have the Babylonian exile, we have the Persian exile, we have the Greek exile, and we have the Edom Edomite exile, which we're still experiencing now. That's the Roman exile. But he says there was a fourth, the last exile is coupled with two things with Ishmael, the Arabs. The Arabs, so the last exile are the Arabs and Edom, which is Esau. So he says, the Vilna Gon says, the merit of Avram will deal with Ishmael, with the Arabs, it's his son. The merit of Yitzchak will deal with Esau, with Edom. But we have a fifth, we have another problem. We have the influence of the era of Rav. When we left Egypt, the rabble, they were a fifth column. And he says that wheat has three covers. You have the chaff, that when you thresh it, you break it off. Then you have, it's called tevin, it's the straw. That's the second cover. Then you have the bran. The difference between the bran and the chaff and the straw, the straw and the chaff are only an outer co coating. That's the Bran is directly attached to the kernel itself. That has to be ground. You have to grind it. You have to crush the kernel to separate the bran from the wheat itself. That's what? That's Yusurim. That's suffering. So therefore he says the only way we're able to detach and expunge that impurity from ourselves, which is the influence of that fifth column, which is the rabble, you gotta really put your shoulder to the wheel and you gotta grind it. The only way Torah can be acquired because the rabble's influence, that's not external, that's internal. The only way you could remove that and achieve Torah on its purest level is only applying yourself where you totally, you deprive yourself of all the pleasures of life. And only then do you have the purest result, which is the Torah itself. Therefore, in a Torah, Nix El Misha Memes Atzmol Leo. Zosa Torah. It's, it's terrific because why did, we, why, did, why did we sin with the golden calf? Of course, the rabble. We speak about the contamination in the tent. Why is there that contamination? Because that's the rabble's influence. They instigated the golden calf. It's the same post. Zosa Torah. Adam Kiyomus Be'oil. How do you deal with that impurity? In a Torah, Nix El Misha Memes Atzmol. You have to undergo tremendous amount of deprivation. Only then are you able to extract that impurity from yourself. To the end result should be that pure result, which is the pure kernel. That's the idea. That's why Enatornix El Misha Memes Atzmolah for that reason. It's interesting. The only person who achieves that, who when you detach yourself from all physical pleasures, what are you basically living as? A spiritual person. You're a spiritual person. Impurity has no relevance to spiritual. 
So when you achieve that posture of spirituality, automatically that impurity of the, the influence of the Erev detaches itself. It's automatic. When you live as the material being, then you have that level of association. So therefore that's Odom Kiyomus Boil in Atur Nixus Elami Shememis Atzmo Aleo.